Hi, my name is Seth Jaffe. I'm the Chief of the Ethics Law and Policy Branch at the U.S. Office of Government Ethics. And welcome. Welcome to today's introductory class into advising employees who want to write a book uh, and get paid for it. Um, advising, you know, outgoing officials as well as incoming nominees in this area really picks up in the time period leading up to an election and continues after the election. So we thought this would be a great time for a brief refresher on the basic rules that apply to outgoing and incoming employees concerning when and under what circumstances an employee may receive compensation for writing a book. I'll start by reviewing many of the main points covered in OGE's Book Deal Advisory Opinion, LA 08-06, that was issued in 2008. I'll walk us through the basics of any book deal analysis, as well as how best to use the job aids contained in the advisory. And those job aids in the advisory are very important and very helpful, I think. Now, since the issuance of that advisory in 2008, OGE has received many variations on several complicated book deal questions that are not directly addressed in that opinion. We have given out consistent oral advice on these questions, um, but I'm not sure if these answers are known throughout the wider ethics community. So if you'd like to better understand how to counsel employees who might want to shop a book deal around on their way out of government service, or who might want to engage in promotional activities concerning a book they're writing or have written, look at LA 20-07. We're not gonna cover those advanced topics today. Today is the introductory class. So before we jump right in, let's take a minute to reflect on the main purposes behind these regulations, placing limitations on employees' ability to get paid for outside writing. Next slide, please. So take a second, look at these people um, and think to yourself, do I recognize these people? And think, you know, what do they have in common? Well, I'll tell you what they have in common. What they have in common is that they both were elected officials who resigned from office amid book deal scandals. Next slide, please. So the first person, the person on the left, Catherine Pugh, she's the recent former mayor of Baltimore. And in 2019, she pled guilty to federal crimes tied to a children's book series she wrote. She pled guilty after the FBI investigated her writing and selling a series of books known as Healthy Holly books with titles like Exercising is Fun and Vegetables Are Not Just Green. However, money is. I added that last bit. While she was a board member um, of the University of Maryland Medical System, UMMS, Pew sold books to that same medical system. The arrangement generated approximately $800,000 for the ex-mayor, much of it from companies that had business ties to the city government. In addition, it was subsequently discovered that the $800,000 in payments were significantly more than the book contract was objectively worth. The charges she's pled guilty to, wire fraud conspiracy, conspiracy to defraud the government, and two counts of tax evasion, carried a maximum penalty of 35 years in prison and she was subsequently sentenced to three years in prison. Now, the other person on that slide um, was Jim Wright. He's the not so recent former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Mr. Wright resigned as Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1989 as a result of an ethics investigation by House Ethics Committee into sales of his book of speeches and essays. Mr. Wright was suspected of circumventing House, house rules on outside income by accumulating more than $54,000 in royalties from bulk sales of his 1984 book, Reflections of a Public Man. The accusation was that in lieu of campaign contributions or speaking fees, which were tightly regulated, groups with businesses before the House made bulk purchases of the book. In April 1989, the Ethics Committee reported that it found reason to believe that Mr. Wright had violated the rules of congressional conduct. Now, the point here is that the ethics laws and rules in this area can be very complicated and difficult to provide guidance on. However, I want all of us to keep in mind the very important purposes animating the rules. Specifically, these rules are designed to ensure, among other things, that executive branch officials do not receive bribes in the form of bogus payments for writing. And more subtly, the rules are designed to ensure that any executive branch official who gets paid to write a book 
while they are in government service, first, be paid an amount commensurate with the service they provide. Second, that it concern a topic they have actual expertise in. Third, to ensure that the book is not related to their official duty. And fourth, be offered by a source who is not in a position to benefit from the actions the employee takes on the job. So let me ask you again to think to yourself, if these four goals are accomplished, what ultimately is achieved? Next slide, please. So the goal is that of ensuring that public office is not used for private gain, and that can increase the trust in government decision making. So for example, um, Ms. Pugh and Mr. Wright, um, their um, the trust and the decisions that they made affecting the entities that were paying them for their writing certainly would be called into question. And these purposes animate all the rules that we'll go over today. Next slide, please. So when can an employee get paid for writing a book? Um, it seems like such a simple question. Although it seems simple, answering when an employee may receive compensation for writing a book is anything but simple. This is a difficult area because of the many laws, regulations, and executive orders that govern. OGE issued um, advisory opinion on March 6, 2008, and this was our attempt to pull together all of these diverse authorities. This opinion is a comprehensive guide for ethics officials to refer to when confronted with an employee who wants to write a book in their personal capacity and get paid for it. Legal Advisory 20-07 um, followed, and that concerns issues that um, stem from marketing a book. Today, we'll review some of the major points in the advisory opinion from 2008, but there will not be time to go over everything. We'll emphasize the quick reference tools, the tables and citation overviews contained within the opinion. And again, these job aids are very important and often provide um, a quick reference tool for people who um, have a particular question, but may not need to know the answers to every question. One thing I wanna highlight up front is that section 807 of the standards of conduct, the teaching, speaking, and writing rules, um, do not bar any employee from writing on any subject. It does, however, contain broad prohibitions against an employee's receipt of compensation for writing that relates to their official duties. Therefore, Section 807 only prohibits the receipt of compensation for writing under certain circumstances. So if a person wants to engage in outside writing and not get paid for it, then the teaching, speaking, and writing rule in 807 doesn't even apply. Now, in our attempts to pull together these diverse rules, OGE initially tried to put together one comprehensive flowchart or decision tree as a guide. However, each time we try to do so, our flowcharts ended up looking something like this. Next slide, please. We came up with all sorts of, you know, crazy looking flowcharts, graphs, and visual aids. You know, we quickly came to the determination that we had a problem. And the problem was there were just so many rules that applied. Agency supplemental regulations, 18 U.S.C. 209 supplementation of salary, um, Executive Order 12674, the nature of the employee, whether they're an SGE or not, 807, 2636.303, that's the definition of compensation, CNC, whether someone's a covered non-career employee, misuse of position concerns. Here it mentions the Colbert Report. We had people going on TV promoting their books, and obviously misuse of title issues became an issue. So we recognize that this problem was that there were so many issues to address. Each time an employee walks into your office and tells you they want to write or have written a book and they want to know whether they get paid for it. And those issues involve, for example, who wrote the book? What is it about? What is the type of compensation being offered? When is the compensation received? Who is making the offer of the payment? Why are they making the offer? Are there any other considerations? Um, such as, um, you know, someone's use of title. So as a result, we decided to structure an advisory opinion around the answers to these and related questions. This is not a flow chart or a decision tree exactly. However, it is a suggested structure 
um, to approach book deal questions. And so there are six main questions that I've mentioned. Um, a couple I'll just highlight here. Um, it's always going to be um, important to know whether a book is related to the employee's official duties, and that could be related to official duties because what is the book about? The subject matter of the book. Of course, that is one way it can be related to an employee's official duties. In addition, who is offering the compensation and why? And what's important to know is that the prohibition kicks in even if the subject matter of the book is not related to the person's official duties, but the offer is made by an impermissible source or for an impermissible reason. Now, the advisory includes two tables that could be used as quick reference guides, as I mentioned before, and that might help you to quickly and easily determine the questions most relevant to your particular situation. And we'll be going over in slides in the future in this presentation, um, these quick reference guides and how to use them. Um, there are tables, and one table addresses the rules that apply to regular employees and SGEs, while the other table addresses how various rules apply to covered non-career or CNC employees and those appointed by the president to a full-time non-career position or PA employees. A separate table is necessary for CNC and PA employees because they are subject to additional rules such as the 15% outside earned income limitation and the outside earned income ban. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is that 807, the 15% outside earned income limitation, and the outside earned income ban are all restrictions focused on compensation and receipt of compensation. And this will be the focus that we'll talk about today. However, as you all know, there are always many other ethics related considerations that come up um, that are not compensation related when you're advising employees who want to write a book, such as the use of title or misuse of position, just the name two. So we also included in the advisory two very helpful job aids, two single page citation overviews containing all the relevant citations keyed to each question so you would know where to look up the answers, including all of those non-compensation related issues. And we'll go through those um, citation overviews shortly. Next slide, please. So let's now talk about the specific questions that the um, legal advisory is um, oriented around. And the first question is, um, who is writing the book? What type of employee are there? And this is important because the ethics rules apply differently depending on what type of employee is seeking advice on writing a book and getting paid to do so. And the first part of our discussion today, we'll focus on regular employees and SGEs. And in the second part, we'll move on to covered non-career employees um, and presidentially appointed um, employees to full-time non-career positions. So what is a regular employee? Well, most employees in the federal government and the executive branch are regular employees, but there is no one definition of what a regular employee is. Basically, a regular employee is defined by what um, he or she is not. A regular employee is not a special government employee. They're not a political appointee or a covered non-career employee or presidentially appointed to um, a Senate, presidentially appointed to a full-time non-career position. So regular employees are your, you know, your kind of normal, regular GS 12, 13, 14, and so forth. Um, and most employees are regular employees, but they're defined by what they are not. Now, special government employees, what's a special government employee? In general, a special government employee is an employee who is retained to work temporarily for the government for no more than 130 days in any 365 day period. And depending if you're a regular employee or a special government employee, some of the book deal rules will apply differently. Next slide, please. So once you know what type of employee you're advising, the next question is, what is the book about? Is the book related to an employee's official duties? Because remember, the restriction is being able to receive compensation for writing a book that is related to your official duties. That's where the restriction is. So 807 describes six ways in which a book may be considered related to a regular employee's or an SGE's official duties. If the employee's writing falls within any one of these six categories, then usually the employee may not receive compensation for the writing. Again, it doesn't mean they can't do the writing, it means they can't receive compensation for it. 
Now, the six ways in which a book may be related to an employee's official duties of a regular employee or an SGE can be divided into two main classifications. First, a book may be related to an employee's official duties based on the book's subject matter. Now, the subject matter restriction is important, of course, because we want to ensure that a government employee does not improperly personally benefit from using non-public government information or uses their official position to enrich themselves at the expense of the public interest. Determining whether the subject matter of a book relates to an employee's official duties is a common issue that you'll probably encounter often. Now, because of our time limitations today, we're not going to review um, the analysis of whether a book relates to an employee's official duties. Um, in fact, a whole class can be taught on that and a whole class has been taught on that. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to OG's website and under the Institute for Ethics and Government, there is a one hour ethics fundamental series class titled Outside Activities, Teaching, Speaking and Writing Related to Official Duties. So although we won't go over that today, it's certainly covered in depth in the legal advisory. It's covered in depth in that class. But that is a very common issue that will come up that you'll have to address when you're confronted with an employee who wants to know whether they can get paid for their outside writing. Now, second, a book may be considered related to an employee's official duties based on who is providing the compensation and why they're offering that compensation. Now, it seems a little counterintuitive that a book becomes related to an employee's official duties regardless of the topic of it, but based on who offers the compensation and why. Um, but there are very significant reasons um, why these um, limitations are in place. So one provision of 807 deals with the possibility that the public may question the integrity of a government official who is being compensated for writing a book um, based upon who the offer was made by. So if the offer is made by a prohibited source or a bad prohibited source, as we say, someone who um, can be affected by the performance or non-performance of the government employee's job to whom they are making the offer. If that's the case, then regardless of the topic of the book, a person will not be able to write that book and get paid for it. And think get back to Jim Wright and Catherine Pugh. They wrote books and got paid by people who could be affected by the performance or non-performance of their jobs. And obviously it called into question the integrity of their service. Now, a second provision deals with the possibility that the integrity of a uh, government official writing a book may be questioned based upon why the offer to write the book was made. So if the circumstances indicate that the invitation to write the book was extended to the employee primarily because of his or her official position rather than his or her expertise in the subject matter. So, for example, and I've seen this, a publishing company might make a, a standing offer to all cabinet secretaries to pay them to write their autobiography. In that case, it's clear that the, the offer was made uh, because of their official position. And as a result, um, there's a prohibition on the um, cabinet secretary in that case to be able to write that book and get paid in any manner for it. Next slide, please. So the next question relates to timing, and this is um, fairly complicated. We'll go into this a little bit in depth here, um, but it won't touch on every topic that relates to timing, but the timing of the writing and the receipt of the compensation. So as we said, in order for the rules to apply, there has to be writing, and there has to be government service, and there has to be receipt of compensation. But all these have to overlap in order for our rules to apply. So because the standards of conduct only apply to employees, it is critical that the writing occurred during the employee's government service, and that he or she receive some portion of the compensation while he or she is employed by the government. So timing issues make the analysis of book deals particularly difficult. However, there are a couple of rules of thumb that can make the timing issues a little bit less complex. First, the ethics rules do not restrict receipt of compensation unless the writing occurs during government service. And second, the ethics rules generally only restrict receipt of compensation during government service, but no receipt of compensation is attributable to the time the writing occurs if it's received pursuant to a contract. So we'll unpack that a little bit coming up. Next slide, please. 
So here you can see a graph on receipt of compensation. So we'll go over what this graph means. The bottom line is that first, government service, second, compensation, and third, writing. Government service, compensation, and writing must overlap at some point in time in order for the compensation related ethics rules to apply. 807, the 15% outsider income limitation, which we'll talk about later, and the outsider income ban. So on the chart, what does that mean? So if you look at the chart, there's the um, y-axis is activity and the x-axis is time. There's writing, compensation, and government service activities. And in order for the rules to apply, because the rules only apply to employees, you must be able to draw one perpendicular line that bisects in time the writing, the compensation, and the government service. If that can be done, then the rules apply. If it cannot be done, the rules don't apply. So if writing compensation and government service, if one of these three activities does not overlap with the others, then the rules don't apply and none of the rules prohibit the receipt of the compensation. Doesn't mean there might be some other rule that would prohibit it, but none of these rules that we're talking about today would prohibit the receipt of compensation. However, if that line does bisect in time, all three of these activities, so writing compensation and government service all overlap at one point in time, that means the rules apply. Doesn't mean the person can't get compensated. It means the rules apply and they have to be applied. So let's talk about some examples. So first, as I said, none of the provisions in Section 807, teaching, speaking, and writing, will bar a regular employee or an FGE who writes a book before entering government service from receiving compensation for the book while he or she is in government. On the graph, the writing line will end before the government service line begins. Similarly, a former employee or an S uh, a former regular employee or an SGE after leaving government service may enter into an agreement with a publisher to receive compensation for writing a book, even if the book is related to his or her official duties. On the graph, the lines representing writing and compensation will not start until after the government service line end. Now, some writing that occurs during government service will not implicate the rules because no compensation is received for the writing. So, for example, a regular employee or an FGE who writes a book on any topic solely on speculation. So they basically write a book hoping that someday they'll sign a contract, hoping someday someone will pay them for this writing, but it's not occurring while they're in government. So they write this book on speculation during government service with no agreement to publish it. No one's agreeing to pay for it. So they write this during government service. They will not violate any of the provisions of 807 if they get paid after they leave. And that's because, looking again back on the graph, the line representing compensation will not start until after government service line ends. Now, there are some um, wrinkles that we'll talk about now for a minute. However, for example, um, the employee, however, cannot sign a contract and write the book related to his official duties while in government, while simply deferring the pocketing of the money of the payment until after he or she leaves government. So, for, so what happens, let's say, is that uh, you write a book and you sign a contract and the publisher says, we'll pay you a million dollars. But they say, we won't actually give you the million dollars until the day after you leave government. Now, in this instance, this employee will have received compensation the minute they sign the contract because the definition of compensation includes the promise to pay under a contract. That's a form of compensation. It's a form of consideration. It's a promise for a promise. I promise to write the book. You promise to pay me. That promise is compensation. So. If they sign that contract while they're in government, they have compensation while in government. Therefore, all three lines in the graph will overlap at one point in time and the ethics rules will apply. If you look at the graph, um, you'll see that compensation line is really long. So in this example, the person probably signed the contract at an early point in time, started writing in government service at the same time. Now, as long as that contract is in force, the compensation line is a solid line through time. 
That's why that line is so long, because once the contract is signed, receipt of compensation is continuous so long as the contract is in effect. So, why is this the case? Without this, it would be too easy to undermine the entire rule and the purpose for it. You could have an employee offered a book deal by someone who has business before them and pay them a lot of money under the contract, but just delay it to the day after they leave. Um, and obviously that would undermine um, the whole purpose of the rule. Next slide, please. So the next question is, what is the type of compensation? Different types of compensation are treated differently under some of the rules. So for book deals, the two most common types of payment are royalties, a percentage of the proceeds from the sale of each book paid to the author from the publisher. So royalties aren't earned until books are sold. In advance, an upfront cash payment from the publisher to the author that is earned back through future sales. So in advance seems appropriately named uh, a payment that is made prior to any sales of books. However, reimbursement for travel expenses provided in connection with the teaching, speaking, or writing are excluded from the definition of compensation for regular employees and SGEs. So let's talk about an example. A regular employee cannot get paid to write a book related to his or her official duties or receive a fee for giving a speech about the book. But he or she can get travel expenses reimbursed to go to and speak about the book. So the travel expenses, the reimbursement are not considered um, compensation for regular employees and SGEs. However, I do note that um, the travel expenses would be considered um, compensation for covered non-career and PA employees, which we'll talk about later. Next slide, please. So this next slide is very important. It's the last question. What other ethics rules and considerations may apply? And the answer is often uh, a lot. Um, here are a lot of other um, potential um, ethics considerations, and they're addressed um, in the job aids that we'll go over in the second portion of this, of this talk today. First are writing related activities. What constitutes writing? Is substantive editing writing? The answer is yes. Is proofreading writing? The answer is no. But there are other issues that come up for writing related activities. What about supplemental agency regulations? Many agencies have prior approval requirements for employees to engage in outside activities for pay. So obviously it's important to know whether, you know, the agency supplemental regulation plays a role in the analysis. Financial conflicts of interest. So once an employee signs a contract with a publisher, they have uh, a financial interest with the publisher and the publisher, um, the employee is not able to work on any particular matter that could affect the uh, ability or willingness of the publisher to make payments under the contract. The impartiality concerns. Once an employee signs with a publisher to pay um, them for a book, um, they have a covered relationship with the publisher. They're engaging in a non-routine um, consumer transaction, uh, business transaction with the publisher. So there are going to be limitations on the ability of the employee to work on party matters um, where the um, publisher is a party or represents a party. Supplementation of salary. Um, if the writing that's being compensated was produced as part of the employee's job, then payment for that and receipt of payment for that could be criminal under supplementation of salary statute 18 USC section 209. But I will note that although 807 in the standards prohibits it, um, for SGEs, um, 209 does not apply to SGEs, so that wouldn't be criminal for SGEs, but it'd still be prohibited to get paid for work that you promote, you produce for the government by an outside source, um, still be prohibited by 807. And finally, misuse of position issues come up all the time. Um, the use of official time for a personal activity or the use of official supplies, um, the use of title and connection with an outside activity. Um, these are issues that come up all the time and the job aid in the legal advisory and the citation index is a very helpful reminder and guide on those topics. Next slide, please. Now that we've reviewed the six primary questions that need to be explored, let's review a reference table that you can refer to when a regular employee or an SGE comes to you asking whether they can get paid for writing a book. And the point here, and you can see from the title of this table, 
only use this table once you've determined that the employee asking to get paid for writing a book is a regular employee or an SGE. And I'll review um, how to use these tables when we discuss the table addressing covered non-career and PA employees. But once you're familiar with the table, it can be a real time saver and a great resource for you when an employee asks your advice on whether she can get paid for writing a book. So when you look at the table, you will see that the headings um, talk about when the writing occurs and when the compensation is received and then how 807 applies depending on those answers. So we'll come back to this when we look at a more complicated table that applies to CNC and PA employees. Next slide, please. So then here's the citation overview. This is the first half, actually, of the citation interview, uh, citation overview, determining whether a regular employee or an SGE may receive compensation for writing a book. In addition to reference tables, the advisory opinion also contains these two overviews of various citations, the statutes, regulations, and executive orders categorized um, by the questions that they help to answer. So again, when you look at the title of this overview, you should only use this particular citation overview once you've determined that the employee is asking to get paid for writing a book um, and that employee is a regular employee or an SGE. And again, I'll review these tables in more in depth when we talk about the CNC and PA employees. I will note, however, that as you can see, um, it is organized, you know, one, two, three, the first three questions of the six questions, you know, what type of employee is it related to official duties? What is the timing of the work and the receipt of the compensation? And then there are citations underneath, underneath each one of them to help provide you um, a roadmap of how to answer these questions. Next slide, please. And you can see here, here are the next three questions um, uh, around which the legal advisory is oriented. Um, what is the type of compensation? Um, who is offering the compensation and why, and what are the other considerations. And this other considerations um, citation index is very important because it's a whole host of other issues, tangentially related issues that almost always come up or some subset of them come up when you're giving advice to an employee who wants to get paid for writing a book. And you hear you have one comprehensive source of those types of issues. So it's an issue spotter, as well as the citations of where to look up those answers. So now that we've reviewed some of the um, ethics rules as they apply to regular employees and SGEs, let's turn our attention to covered non-career employees and employees appointed by the president to a full-time non-career position or PA employees. Many of the issues are similar for these employees and the regular employees and SGEs we've just discussed. So now um, we'll focus only on those issues that differ significantly from what we've just reviewed. Next slide, please. So it is still important, of course, to determine what type of employee you're giving advice to. Now here, the employee will either be a CNC employee or a PA employee, um, but what are those employees? Who, who is a CNC employee? Who's a PA employee? Now, there's several ways in which an employee may qualify as a CNC employee under 5 CFR 2636.303A. Generally, there are three primary points to remember about a CNC employee. A CNC's appointment must be one of several types of non-career appointments. Typically, when a position is identified as non-career, it refers to a political appointment where the appointee can be removed at the will of the appointing official. So non-career is a political. Next, the covered non-career employee must be covered. What does covered mean? To be covered, they must be in a position classified above a GS-15 in the general schedule or for those positions not under the general schedule, they have to be paid a rate of basic pay that is at least 120% of the minimum rate of basic pay payable for a GS-15. So basically they have to be political and they have to have a high up position or be paid a lot. And finally, they cannot be an SGE. If a person is an SGE, if an employee is an SGE, they are not a CNC employee. So now let's talk about PA employees. Generally, a PA employee means that the employee who is appointed is appointed by the president to a full-time position. There are three primary points to remember about PA employees. First, the employee must be appointed by the president. 
Second, the employee must be full time, so it can't be an SGE. And third, the employee must not be excluded from coverage. And there are certain exclusions for certain low level presidential appointees, usually below a GS um, level nine. So different rules apply to CNC and PA employees versus regular employees and SGEs. There are four major differences in how and what ethics rules apply to CNC and PA employees versus the other employees. However, you need to keep in mind that these rules apply in the alternative. So what does that mean? In other words, when an employee is subject to more than one rule, the rule that is the most restrictive will govern. And I'll give examples shortly. So four major ways the rules differ for these employees. The first major way in which the rules differ for CNC and PA employees is in the definition of related to official duties. Under Section 807, the definition of related to official duties is broader for CNC employees than for regular employees and SGEs. So when you think about it, a person and an employee cannot get paid for writing a book that relates to their official duties. If our CNC employees has more topics that relate to their official duties, that means they can get paid for less of their writing. So as a result, it'll be more difficult for a CNC employee to accept payment for writing a book versus a regular employee or an SGE. Second major way in which the rules differ for CNC employees concerns the ability of a CNC employee to earn income from a source outside the government. A CNC employee may not, in any calendar year have outside earned income attributable to that year, which exceeds 15% of the annual rate of basic pay for an EL level two. So an EL level two um, currently can make $212,100 and 15% of that is 31,815. And this limitation is contained in the Ethics and Government Act. Now, what this means is that no matter whether they can receive payment for their outside writing, it cannot exceed this amount. So if it's permissible to receive a payment, it's capped at this amount. Regular employees and SGEs have no cap if the compensation is permissible. So you might see a theme here. The CNC and PA employees generally are subject to more restrictive rules because they are higher up in the government and the potential appearance for corruption is greater. They have more restrictions on their ability to engage in outside writing and get paid for it. In fact, they have greater restrictions on their ability to receive outside payment, period. Now, one important thing to remember, a CNC employee who writes on a topic related to his or her official duties as defined in 807 may not receive any earned income or compensation for the writing. Therefore, the rules on how to apportion payments for writing under the 15% limitation apply to a CNC employee only if the writing is not related to his or her duties. This is an example of how the ethics rules apply in the alternative and the more restrictive rules of 807 govern. So they have the outside income limitation and 807 both apply to this employee. Whichever one restricts more is what governs. So let's take an example. Let's say you have a CNC employee at NASA and that employee writes a book about space travel. Now, in theory, um, a CNC employee can receive up to $31,815 of earned income in a calendar year for writing that book. Now, if that book is not related to their official duties, they can get $31,815. However, under 807, if that book is related to their official duties, even though the outsider income limitation allows payment up to $31,815, if it book relates to their official duties, 807 will not allow that employee to receive any income for that book. Now, the third major way in which the rules differ for PA employees concerns the ability of a PA employee to earn income from a source outside the government. PA employees may not receive any outside earned income for activities performed during their government service. And this ban, this outside earned income ban, is contained in Executive Order 12674 as modified by 12731. The fourth major way in which the rules differ for CNC and PA employees concerns the definition of compensation or earned income. So under the 15% limitation and under the outside or income ban, royalties are not considered compensation or earned income. Royalties are more 
are considered more akin to um, a stream of revenue from intellectual property, which is more like investment income and less like earned income. So therefore, the ban and the 15% limitation do not apply to royalties. Therefore, a CNC employee or a PA employee are allowed to receive an unlimited amount of royalties for writing a book, so long as the book is not related to their official duties. Remember, 807 still applies and would prohibit this. So if they wrote a book on stamp collecting, for instance, and it was not related to their official duties, and they only got royalties, they could get the unlimited amount of royalties. If they were to get an advance, they couldn't take the advance because that would be prohibited um, under the asset or income limitation or ban. They could get up to 15% of an EL level two if they were a CNC employee. However, if that book happened to be related to their official duties, even though the, the ban and the 15% limitation don't apply to royalties, they still couldn't get any of the royalties because 807 would prohibit it if it relates to their official duties. Next slide, please. So this is the table that you'll use. You can see by the heading of the table, this is the table you would use once you've determined that the employee you're advising um, for writing a book is a CNC or a PA employee. So let's um, take a look at this table. We'll walk through it for a minute. So you can see that there's the headings. There's the timing of the writing, the timing of the compensation, then the application of 807, the application of the absolute income ban to PA employees, and the application of 15% limitation to CNC employees. So let's look at the first row. There's the first row below the headings where it says before government service. So if the writing occurs before government service and the compensation is received before government service. So they wrote the book before they came in, they got paid before they came in, then under 807, compensation is permitted because on that graph that we looked at earlier, the um, writing and compensation lines would end before government service begins. Under the outsider income ban, the compensation is permitted. Under the 15% limitation, that compensation would not count toward the 15% limit because the rules don't apply. So now let's take a look at the sixth row below the headings, and that's the third row of the during government service writing, the bottom one during government service, if the writing occurs during government service, and the compensation is received after government service. Now, I'll talk about what these asterisks mean. You can't see them on this slide, but they are the asterisks do have a, are attached to a footnote in the actual legal advisory. But this all assumes that the writing is done pursuant to a governmental, pursuant to a contract. So the person has a contract to write the book. So they write the book during, um, and they have a contract, they get paid after. Under 807, that compensation is barred if it's related to the official duties because they received compensation, the contract, during government service. So you have the writing during government service, the compensation during government service, even though it's paid after, and you have the contract. So under 807, related to official duties, um, the compensation is barred. And if that's the case under 807, you don't even need to continue looking at the next columns because you're already done. You know that that PA and CNC employee cannot receive the compensation, so that's it. Well, if the, relate, if the writing does not relate to their official duties, then the compensation is permitted under 807. So if it's permitted under 807, you then wanna figure out, well, what about the ban? What about the outside income limitation? Well, under the outsider income ban for PA employees. The advance would be barred in the situation, but royalties were allowed. And for CNC employees under the 15% limitation, the advance will count towards their 15% $31,000 limit, but the royalties don't count towards the limit because they're not considered compensation for the ban or the 15% limit. So now let's take a look at the citation overview. Next slide, please. So this is the first half of the citation overview. And you can see from the heading, this is a citation overview that applies to determining whether a CNC employee or a PA employee may receive compensation for writing a book. So you would use this citation overview once you've determined 
at the employee seeking advice as a CNC or PA employee. So let's talk about this overview for a minute. You know, I really think that, you know, the tables that we just went over and the citation overviews are, again, tremendous job aids that you can jump to and might answer any particular question you have. Of course, the whole legal advisory is instructive, but these job aids, you know, can really provide a great um, shortcut to getting to the answers that you need when you're trying to provide advice to an employee who wants to get paid for writing a book. So here, again, there are the six questions that the legal advisory um, is organized around. Um, what category of employee? Is the book related to official duties? When is the writing performed and compensation received? So what you have is you have the citations um, that go to answering these questions. And there's even a little bit, very little bit of an explanation um, in these um, in, the, in this overview, um, giving you a clue as to what the answer actually is or what the citations say. If that's not sufficient, then of course, then you go to the citation. But for example, under the third one, when is the writing performed and compensation received? So here, you would want to know the definition of received and um, what applies to each employee. And so here, it tells you which rules apply to which employee, CNC and PA, CA only, PA only. And then it even gives a little bit of a clue here. It says, under all these provisions, receipt of compensation is usually attributable to the time the writing occurs, unless written solely on speculation during government service. So that was the point we made before, that if you write um, and you have a contract, then, and you write during government service and you have a contract to do that writing, and then the person gets paid after they leave government, that payment after government is attributable to the time the writing occurred during government and is received, the consideration under the contract is received when they are a government employee. And now this gets back to the asterisks that were on the previous table. It says, unless written solely on speculation during government service. So if the person, the employee, writes the book, during government service, does not have a contract to write it, does not have any promise or legally binding um, agreement to pay for it. They just write the book and they hope to get paid later. They leave government after writing this book solely on speculation. And then after they leave, they sign a contract to get paid for it. At that point, the um, compensation is not attributable to the time the writing occurred because there was no compensation concurrent with the writing. At that point, when it's written on speculation, the employee's writing and government service overlap, but the compensation didn't start until after they left government because they had no contract and no agreement to pay for the writing while they were in government. Uh, next slide, please. And so here are the last three questions. Um, what is the type of compensation? who is offering the compensation and why, and other considerations. Again, just tremendous um, you know, identification of the variety of topics for you um, that might come up. Um, compensation for writing related activities, supplemental agency regulations, public office for private gain, um, conflicting outside employment and activities. So it's really kind of a potpourri of issue spotting for you as an ethics official, as well as giving you the citations necessary to refer to when trying to answer a question that involves one of these um, variety of issues that's likely to come up when you're giving advice on book deals. So these job aids, the citation overviews that are contained in the legal advisory, of course, are designed to um, be self-contained and to answer your questions. Next slide, please. However, um, obviously, um, there will be times when you will have follow-up questions or questions that are not answered um, in the advisory. So um, if you're an employee looking for advice and have questions, um, please feel free to contact um, the ethics official at your agency. And if you're an agency ethics official with questions, um, please feel free to contact uh, your OG desk officer. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I certainly hope that this presentation has been helpful. Thanks again.